Pena Kotou, Ete we Fanui, and Homaina Yota Malai Maha. Tena Kotou, Inga Aitua Ottawa. Eoku Hoa, Oteropu Atu Matawinga, and me here to Ratene Kia Kotou Katoa. Kotou Naka no Hiora, O Tata Hua Maha, Quehuri Tepo. Itene Wa. Mora tau te honore, mora tau te koloria. Nā reira, ko rātau ki a rātau, ko tātau ki a tātau, ki a ora hui hui tātau katoa. This is the story of the Māori Battalion, told through the experiences of five of our comrades. It cannot hope to be a complete record, but at least it tries to demonstrate the price which these young men were prepared to pay for the privileges of citizenship. It is a story about young people who, along with the other units of the New Zealand Division, contributed to the Division's fame. We hope that the young people of today can identify with some of the things which motivated the Ropu Atu Matawenga, the 28th Māori Battalion. E kore rātau e koro heketia, pene i a tātau e ora nei. E kore te wā e whakaruruhi, ngā tau rā nei e whakakore i a rātau. I te uranga mai o te rā, a tainua ki tōna ngarotanga, ta maumahara tātou ki a rātou. Master made an inspection of this later bunch of nails in a dictator's coffin. Among the troops inspected on this occasion were many Maoris, men whose destiny is linked with that of the whole British Commonwealth of Nations and who mean to keep it so. The march passed. It's hard to say which of the Empire's troops from overseas look best, but they're all good enough to prove better than any the enemy can produce. The Māori Battalion was a World War II infantry unit. It was made up entirely of volunteers as a result of efforts made by Māori parliamentarians and tribes. As part of the New Zealand Division, it saw action in Greece, Crete, North Africa and Italy. One of its most resolute but respected enemy leaders was Erwin Rommel. The Desert Fox considered New Zealanders to be the finest troops on the Allied side. War was a frequent element in the lives of the many societies of ancient Polynesia. Competition and revenge for insults or grievances were the main causes of conflict. In New Zealand, the Maori refined their warlike heritage to take into account the climate and terrain of their new home. British and colonial troops found in the Māori a staunch adversary. Their physique, fitness, endurance and speed could not be bettered. Their shrewd military tactics so impressed the British that they recorded them and utilised them in wars from the Crimea to the Somme. These traditions of combat were passed down from generation to generation and were suddenly rekindled by a spark which ignited worldwide conflict. The Maori people were determined to play their part in their own way and began recruitment of a fighting unit ready to take up arms beside the Pākehā, their European counterparts. In a deliberate move to ensure that the battalion be Maori in identity as well as name, it was divided into tribal companies. A company was made up of North Auckland tribes. 
B Company from Rotorua, Bay of Plenty, Topor and the Coromandel. C Company comprised East Coast tribes, notably the Ngati Poro and Rungofakata. D Company covered a wider area where there were fewer Maori. Waikato, Hawke's Bay, Taranaki, Wellington, the South Island, Chathams and Stewart Island. They parade again, 2,000 members of the 2nd New Zealand Expeditionary Force in Wellington before leaving for service overseas. For the second time in a quarter of a century, the manhood of the Dominion has heard and answered the call to imperial duty. So this is goodbye, good luck and a safe return. The original destination of the troop ship Aquitania was Egypt, where training would commence with New Zealand soldiers of the first echelon already there. The racist policies of South Africa meant that, for the Maori, leave in Cape Town was limited. During their period in South Africa, the evacuation at Dunkirk took place. An invasion of England appeared imminent, and the convoy changed course from Egypt to Britain. Well, the main thing, I suppose, is the route routes we had every day. We just about walked to England. Every day we went round and round the ship, and they, it was a big ship. And going round, it, oh boy, it's mighty long. We felt as if we walked to England. Sixteenth June, nineteen forty, Gulag, Scotland. The Maori Battalion arrive in the United Kingdom keen to protect its shores from the Nazi threat. Another step on the great adventure that has caused many of them to leave their tribal homes 17,000 miles away. They bring with them their language, songs and cultural expressions of war. An easy marriage with the British traditions of army discipline. For the duration of the war, reinforcements from New Zealand will keep the battalion's ranks filled with an average of 800 men. Mostly young. Fears of an invasion of England diminished. In April of 41, the Maori were rushed from training in Egypt to assist in the defense of Greece. It was a catastrophe. The German forces and Luftwaffe overwhelmed them. Hopelessly outnumbered, they were forced to retreat from their first taste of combat. Attention immediately shifted south to the island of Crete. The battalion followed. The increased use of fighter planes and bombers in World War II meant that those who controlled Crete and her airports would have control too over much of the Mediterranean Sea. The gentle existence of the Cretan people would soon be ruptured by every violation that war could offer. Noch einmal ist England in Besitz von Kreta. On the morning of the 20th of uh, May 1941, we were sitting having breakfast under some alder trees just below this mound when we heard a continuous buzz from the sea. And we looked over and the sky was black on the horizon. It was the beginning of the invasion. In kurzer Zeit ist der Flugplatz Malemes in deutscher Hand. The Maleme aerodrome was one of the key areas to the control of Crete. It was an open door for the German occupying army. This hill overlooking the Maleme tarmac was the Maori objective. If captured, no enemy plane would have been able to land. The door would be locked. Under heavy fire, they battled their way through dense vegetation guided by a system of irrigation canals. The attack failed. Orders came to withdraw. The battle for Crete was lost. The New Zealand and Australian men wearily trudged the mountainous route to Svaikia, where the Navy would evacuate them. The transfer of the German to the Maghreb of Crete was a very big deal. The only one who could see that those thousands of miles away from the country that was here in the middle of the war was not able to write it, that is, how big the transfer was made. And even 
Εδώ σε αυτή την περιοχή μπορώ να πω πως ήταν With their base established at Mardi near Cairo, the New Zealand soldiers struggled to come to terms with their home for the next two years, the vast North African desert. Men in wide spaces, with nothing in view but the horizon, and the blazing sun, is very, very puny and insignificant. The forces of nature had... Uh, too great to imagine and the New Zealand division passing through a, a strange country and strange conditions had to adjust themselves very quickly to the whole scene. They learned one of the truths of war, that actual combat is often a sudden climax to long periods of inactivity, boredom, and endless hard work. Recreation and sports were physically beneficial and good for morale. They did not, however, replace for most a man's home and family. Bully Jackson writing home to his mother. How are you tonight, Mum? Well, I hope. As for me, I am well. That's one thing I can say about myself. But I'm slightly browned off with this life. I want to go home. At the beginning of the desert campaign, the Germans seemed certain to overwhelm the Allies. Rommel's progress was hampered by difficulties with supplies and was finally arrested at Al Alamein when they were forced to retreat. Individual stories of heroism abound. At Mitarea Ridge, stretcher bearer Corporal James Pirihi braved intense shell fire to tend to the wounded and bury the dead. Once in the face of enemy machine gun fire, he dressed the wounds of a German soldier and carried him to safety. At Gazala, Private Charlie Shelford saved his encircled platoon. He ran 300 yards toward an enemy machine gun post, shooting from the hip. Despite taking shrapnel from three grenades and having his own gun smashed, he grenaded the enemy position and began the collapse of resistance in that area. The push northwards to meet the first army in Tunisia continued. When a pass was found which would enable the Allies to outflank strong fortifications, the battalion went in. The battle for Tobago Gap started with heavy artillery and air support. Colonel Charles Bennett assigned C Company under Peter Awatere to take a German-held feature, point 209. From the base of a hill later called Hikurangi, Lieutenant Mwanangarimu led his platoon straight up the steep rocky slopes. He single-handedly wiped out two enemy strongposts. His kinsman, Corporal Wiwi Teneti, kept two machine gun nests quiet until his men could outflank and destroy them. From only yards away, the Germans charged with their bayonets. They were repulsed. By nightfall, Awatere and Ngarimu were both wounded. They refused to seek attention and held back repeated bayonet charges. Only when his wounds reduced him to crawling about did Awatere agree to get medical assistance. Ngarimu stayed. Throughout the night, he kept his men awake and alert for continual German attacks. Each time they were driven back by bullet, bayonet, and even stones used as makeshift grenades. On and on the battle went. Both sides were mauled by horrific casualties. Through the carnage, Ngarimu exhorted his men to greater effort. At daybreak, he was killed during an advance, his body falling on top of those he had just shot. The German casualties became insupportable. Appeals from them for medical aid signaled the beginning of the end of the battle. Ngarimu's leadership and bravery inspired Colonel Bennett to recommend him for the Victoria Cross. Decorations highlight individual heroism, but hide the fact that the Mari Battalion always fought as one becoming a startlingly effective fighting unit. In the Maori Battalion, all the men we had were nothing but the best. They were second to none. And uh, whatever decorations the officers have in the Maori Battalion belong to the men, to the battalion, the battalion as a whole. I wonder why he 
join the war. I know I wouldn't have. If I was a man that age and it was voluntary, I wouldn't have joined it. I see when it gets mentioned that I can see the hurt in Nanny's eyes and I feel sorry for her. And In Italy, mountainous country made progress difficult. It was a war of attrition. The victor would be the side who inflicted the most casualties. Captain Monte Wikirifi displayed magnificent leadership and tactics at Cassino before being severely wounded. He refused to imperil his men by being carried out. With shattered legs, he dragged himself along the ground under fire for 15 hours to safety. For two days on the outskirts of Popiano, under very heavy shell fire, Captain Tomwana ran between platoons rallying and urging them on until the enemy tanks and infantry withdrew. On 4th of August, 1944, the liberation of Florence. The Benedictine monastery, founded in 529 AD, overlooked the township of Cassino. It was thought to contain German snipers. In one of the most remembered but also futile decisions of the Italian campaign, this sacred place of God was delivered of 600 tons of high explosives. Before their attack on the Casino railway station, the Māori soldiers of A and B companies gathered together in the warm dusk of a beautiful day. They attended to personal matters. Some wrote letters, while others cleared their pockets in case of capture. When the Padre arrived, there was a feeling amongst the two companies that this battle was going to be tough. They were not to know that of 200 men, only 70 would return to fight again. The Padre called them to prayer and said, Father, look down upon us this moment. Help us to do that which we have to do. Tonight, take those that you want. Tomorrow, let us weep those that are left. Through thy Son, Jesus Christ, let us go on. The drive to push back the enemy continued through a grim Italian winter. The Germans were stubborn in resistance and the final battles were a cataclysm of bombardment and hand-to-hand -hand combat. War in Europe for the Mari Battalion ended in Trieste. It was now time to reflect on their contribution to victory. On the 23rd of January 1946, the Mari Battalion arrived home in Wellington, preceded by their reputation as enthusiastic and fearless warriors, also known for their humor and fellowship. They carried with them the guilts and horrors of their war, but a pride too for having taken a full part in the struggle for New Zealand's future. The camaraderie they had forged would endure over all the years and outlive many of them. But now, it was a time for their families. Individual tribes welcomed their remaining sons home. They returned victorious children of the god of war. In the relief of celebration, the Māori grieved for the loss of so many men. They grieved too for their grandchildren, for in the coming peace, they would not know the influence of the lost leaders who could have passed on the traditions and disciplines of their culture. What it means to me, those fellows that I have buried, never will I forget them. It makes me extra thankful and grateful that God has spared me to bury them and remind me of the fellowship we had. I'm really, really, in my heart, never, never will I forget to thank them for giving me the chance to live. Those who perished for Crete lie in the Suda Bay Cemetery, including Don Stewart's brother Horton, who was shot less than two miles away. The 
The First World War had occurred in an age when it was considered inappropriate for colored races to be fighting with or against white people. Maori involvement was accordingly restricted. In the Second World War, however, they were treated as equals and became a vital part of the cutting edge of Allied efforts to repel the Nazis. In 1943, Sir Nangata wrote that the assets of the Maori in war ought to be equally recognized as assets in peace and that his people's sacrifice was the highest price of citizenship. It's half a century since um, Horton and I said farewell to each other at the outbreak of war. And then my mind reverts back to uh, pre-war when Horton was such a vital person when he was killed uh, so early in the peace, it uh, really devastated the family. I would like to say to Horton uh, that I'd love him to be, to have been with me in, in life over the last uh, 50 years, uh, to have lived his life through. Uh, uh, because there's no telling uh, what he may have been. Howdy, huh? Howdy, Kutu. Go. Mm -hmm. 